Okay, hello there. Um, my name's Jules Gilson. I'm Professor of Creative Practice at UCC, and I'm really delighted to be here um, interviewing Philip Connerton about his beautiful work, Assisted Solo, which was supposed to be part of the Dublin Dance Festival and sadly um, was cancelled, obviously, as part of the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So, um, Philip, I just wanted to start by saying that um, I just rewatched your work um, uh, online um, or a video recording that you sent me. And I was really struck by the difference between um, watching it in that way and when I saw it um, in The Everyman in Cork in uh, 2018, 18 months ago. And um, it was really interesting to me that um, dance as a practice really translates poorly to the screen if it's just for documentation. It's different if it's a dance film. And this is a collaboration in part with a filmmaker, Luca Truffarelli. And um, it's those parts of the screen that you're really drawn to because they're made for a screen. Did you have any um, sense of that when you were looking back at the work yourself? Yes, absolutely. That's absolutely what I noticed, um, particularly these days, I think, because you're so aware of, of those things. And I've, I've been, um, I've been cautious to show any of my work online just for that reason. Um, you know, as you said, unless unless work is is specifically made with that audience in mind, you know, this the uh, uh, for d dance on film, uh, it just doesn't read the same way. I mean, I was particularly aware in one part of assisted solo. You know, we're responding to. The, the, there are three dancers kind of moving on stage while there's this kind of collage of images and memories and sound happening above us. And um, I suppose in live performance, you've got this 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 sense of breath, this noise, the sweat, the a more real sound that's interrupting the two dimensional thing that's happening on screen. And I think that that's a nice juxtaposition juxtaposition like you can jump in and out of it you know what I mean uh but uh definitely as I was watching it on 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 this the, the the documentation of it the recorded version uh I was like oh I was just watching the screen stuff and I kept forgetting to watch the dancers <laughs> <laughs> and I, I thought that I mean the screen stuff is really beautiful Luca's work is incredible it, so is, it's it I, is yeah no I that really struck me and um it also took me back to um when I went I took a group of first year students to see the show. And I didn't really know, I didn't really think too much about what it was about. And I, um, I, I just went, you know, we're a small town cork. There's not a huge amount of stuff on. I love your work and off we went. And um, that visceral sense of, um, of being in the same space and especially my kind of empathetic sense of um, these first years, these young things, a lot of them kind of just out of youth theatre, a lot of them never having seen any dance. And if they had seen dance, they'd never seen any dance that was about, you know, real life that was that had the kind of um, sensibility that you bring to dance practice, which is um, often this combination of tenderness and outrageous hilarity and really rude as well, you know, and I just um, remember again that visceral sense of my own response to the work, but also this sense of of um, the students around me. Um, so I, I was really struck with that. So. Um, so in this, uh, we've got a, um, a, a while to, to talk about your work, which I'm, I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to do that. And um, I wanted to start perhaps um, just by uh, telling people maybe a little bit about the work because they won't have seen it live, many people uh, looking at this. Um, so one of the things that struck me about the work and struck me about a vein of uh, dance practice in Ireland and you being a big exemplar of that is um, dance as a form of, of, of intelligence, of a kind of way of engaging with the world and, um, and something that brings something um, to uh, discourse, just kind of talking about things more broadly, that I really mourn the fact that that isn't, that um, there isn't a connection between broader, the broader world. So this is a piece really about your mum and about um, her dementia and, um, and often our conventional associations with that are, oh, it's going to be really serious. It's going to be really uh, dreadful and uh, and about the, the appallingness of that. And instead, it is um, it is 
absolutely hilarious like wet your knickers hilarious at times and it is very queer it is very much kind of has that intelligence that comes from your sensibility as a gay man it also um is extraordinarily tender and moving and i found that kind of combination of um of uh, of <laughs> of laughing outrageously and and being made to feel really uncomfortable and this incredible tenderness to be something really um distinctive so i just wanted to give that as as an introduction and the the perform it's performed by yourself and two dancers lucia kickham and magali kaye lost her last name kaye gajan and um both of them as well along with yourself really extraordinary performers lucia kickham quite a young um kind of irish dancer choreographer and um, magali kaye or magali i'll just say because i can't remember her last name very well um is an older female dancer and for me um, and I, I, I assume this was intentional, um, choosing um, a performer like that, who is an older female performer, really resonates with um, the, 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 the filming of your mum who's in her 80s. Um, uh, not that Magali is, but she's older. I don't know her exact age, but, but she's 40s, 50s, I'd say. Um, so there's a particular section um, quite near, I suppose, in the first half where um magali and the other dancers but then it extends with magali she's um doing this section um where you've asked her to kind of remember pieces from old dance pieces so would you would you tell us a bit about that section yeah i mean that uh basically um since i've started assisted solo i became kind of very um interested since I began thinking about assisted solo so in 2017 early 2017 maybe even late 2016 um, I started uh, becoming fascinated with memory uh, how the body memory how the body retains information um, how it sustains that information and uh, because of the relationship I was living with my mom and um, What's happened is I, I kind of liked the the test of uh, as a dancer looking at all of the information, uh, all of and, and just I'm talking about choreographic information initially. Um, all of the choreographic, if you if you span your entire career, all of these dances, all of these routines, all of these things that uh, resonated with you, it might be something you've just did in a class when you were seven. It might have been, you know, the things that impacted you the things that stay in your body uh it might not be a whole dance but it might just be a little section it might just be one movement and i became really interested in why they were there and what made them kind of stay i suppose because i was looking at my mom and noticing that certain things remained and certain things dissipated and what was what was the thing that made her hold on to these th things and of course my my natural instinct was to put that into movement so with the dancers myself and Lucia and Magali I asked them uh, to work on moments of their life and, and to pull out these moments and it's kind of a very interesting process because once you begin it, it starts kind of coming out and you're like oh my god I, did, I didn't realize I remember this and so also attaching kind of emotional value to them so not only maybe uh, a particular movement, but where that movement happened for you in your head. And what, where were you? Were you in the garden? Were you on stage? Were you in a massive theater? Was it a studio performance? Was it just to try and uh, recreate uh, with that memory, all of the sensations and, and try to relive that little moment. And, uh, and that's really, for a lot of the choreography that's what's happening but particularly you're right particularly in uh magali's section that's when we really kind of locked into that idea and that's where we really kind of delved into it and pulled it out and she's such a great performer that she's kind of really able to kind of emote and live those experiences and um i think the reason i did that was because again you know caring for my mom i could see that uh often she was often she would um, kind of 
relive experiences. They weren't just memories, they were whole things. And wh whoever was with her at the particular time just became a tool to relive those experiences. So my, my relationship to her, you know, at one moment I could be her son, the next moment I'm her father, the next moment I'm her lover, which is kind of uncomfortable, you know, <laughs> like they love her, but like a boyfriend or something, you know. And uh, so you, you, or her daughter or uh, anything. So you became all of these things and you were just what she needed at that particular time. Time. And I suppose that's what inspired me for, for that particular section. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, and it's um it's an extraordinary section to watch um because you have this sense of um of uh, of quotations from other pieces that have a lived reality. And it's interesting you describe that, that you worked with the dancers to explore that con context, not just the movement, but, but how and what the sensibilities around that, because you can see that in performance because they have a kind of lived presence. Mm -hmm. um, and the piece just at the end of that section where um, it's really um, moving and haunting, which is um, that Magali um, as a character forgets how to sit down and um it's it's such a simple premise um and yeah it 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 kind of is a coda to that section that um is uh is heartbreaking and it, it it's it's one of those moments which gets it seems to me to kind of gets to the heart of not just uh processes of remembering and forgetting but also the loss in that mm -hmm. and i really liked that that sense of playfulness as, as well sorry well, no, as, as, as dancers, I think we're very good at uh, taking something uh, and abstracting it and taking it out of its everyday context. Mm -hmm. And so there was a real way of being able to take this experience of forgetting what is a chair, you know, what is a chair? If you'd never seen a chair before, mm -hmm. you know, how wh what would you deal with? Would you sit on it? Probably, but you, you might do other stuff with it as well. Like, uh, and... So, so it was really to see, to understand what a, a person is going through when an everyday object or uh, becomes completely abstract and, 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 and how they deal with that was, um, it was something that I think we do in our job all the time with bodies and with objects, you know, as dancers, we try and kind of pull them out of the normal and see how our bodies will work with them. So it was very tough physically for her to do that because she takes a lot of risk as well. And it was quite frightening watching her sometimes because I thought, oh, God, she's going to, you know, kill herself. But um, I think, you know, again, going back to dancers working with their own bodies, let alone objects, that was one of the things with my mom that I found fascinating it was her own physicality within her body understanding what she needs when she needs how how her body worked as well because um i think particularly i think everywhere but particularly in ireland um i think you know we we there's a there's a separation between between uh, one person's body and another person's body. We're constantly, we often, you know, don't see people that we've spent our entire lives with. We might never see them naked or we might never see them. And, and there's all sorts of taboos and, and things like that. But perhaps being a dancer, I was, I was given the privilege to actually work with my mother's body and see it and appreciate it for its, its aging beauty. And, uh, and actually just learn how she needed to stand up and sit down, learn how her hips worked, learn how, how flexible or not, not her articulations were. And it, I think I was so glad that I had my experience as a dancer to be able to take that into her life and, and then again, bring it back into the piece, you know? I think that seems to me an extraordinary insight and gift. Do you know, more generally, that it, because um, there's, I was struck in the piece by both its kind of outrageousness at some points and its its sheer humanity and the and how you um, are very uncompromising. But 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 I also know from talking to you and having listened to an after show talk that it doesn't feel um, 
it, it, it seems very authentic the way that it arises from you that um, it's an exploration of kind of what it actually materially means to care for somebody that you love who's in the advanced stages of dementia and um, and the film that the film sections uh, kind of really articulate that in a, in a beautifully poignant way but perhaps we could come back to the film sections I just wanted to pick up from what you've said there um, in terms of the the, the section where you uh, you're concerned about um, your mother your, your mother's dis physical discomfort and this leads to a kind of narrative that again moves from moves from the outrageous to the to the tender um, and uh, there's some discomfort between your mother's legs and it's it's very alarming and like how, how are you going to kind of engage with that and through just to explain to people watching this who haven't seen the piece that um, you express you, you have this ability um, as a performer to be a stand-up comedian you're hilarious when you want to be and it's and that 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 that, that is a skill that not everybody has but you have a, an ability to tell a story and in this section it's a story about how do you um that you that, that you don't push that away and i wonder how again how much that's to do with your training as a dancer and being comfortable with bodies and 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 you know the the, the movements and the and the way that emotional context inflects our bodies is your professional practice that you don't push that away and run to the gp what you do is you you try to to, to find out what's um what's what discomfort why your mother's uncomfortable and this leads to a very highly theatrical section where you um you you try to find out if if, if it's a soreness in her vagina or not and there's then there's a big section where the the, the kind of curtains become the vagina and as part of that and this is very funny it's difficult to describe but it's very funny but then it shifts um, and um, Lucia Kickham erupts out of the vagina as, as, as in a skin, um, skin colored kind of costume with red tassels. And it's again, difficult to describe, but the tone changes and it's an extraordinary, for me, an extraordinary um, exploration of mute pain because what breaks, what seems to me to break your heart about this situation and um, is that she can't tell you what is hurting and something is making her uncomfortable so could you speak a little bit about that section with Lucia yes um so it's it's funny because you know I went after this piece finished I went directly on to the next work which was kind of related to it and um uh you don't I don't I don't talking about dance on film, I don't really watch my own stuff unless I have to remember it or I go back. So it's been a while since I've, I've watched Assisted Solo. In fact, I could quite safely say I, I was I was watching Assisted Solo in preparation to put it on in the dance festival. But until then, I hadn't really touched it. I, you know, it was all it's all inside. It's very, it's very present in, in this in this sense. And um, I was really struck by uh, the the female presence like Magali and and Lucia and how uh, for me it's an incredibly um, f feminine or female piece the perspective the or it, at least the way I see it and the way I feel it is my feminine side there's something uh, there's the softness all of all of uh, the strength and softness and empathy uh, that 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 comes from that comes from a particular side of me that I needed Lucia and Magali to to be there with me on stage. Maybe it's because I'm in a, a family of all men, and so in dealing with my mother, my queerness sometimes felt isolating, and uh, and that. I felt that they could be both me and my mother. They could understand me more maybe and, and help express what I was doing. And uh, yes, with Lucia's, Lucia's performance. Uh, so, so, so that part, she uh, generated the movement herself. I was, the, the, the tassels and the, the tassels came from an experience of, of, that I've pulled into several pieces from my childhood, 
which is when I was a kid, the only way my my parents would get me to bed was if they sang the stripper, you know, da 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 And I would get very excited and to take off my clothes until I was in my nappy, and then they'd put me in my pajamas and send me to bed. So there was this whole there was this whole thing. And so I've always I've brought it. There's I have a tap solo that I tap dance and I take my clothes off and I have tassels on my ass and you know there's, there's all sorts of things of the tassels and that kind of burlesque thing has yeah, yeah. Been with me through my career. And I developed it probably more in my last piece, Mama Festa Memorializing. But um I wanted to bring that in to, uh, and and kind of mold that around what Lucia was doing and just the sem- the simplicity and the repetition of the mu- movement and her beauty and her youth uh, her youth and and her beauty uh, uh, in this in this physical in this physical world that she was creating. I just I just absolutely love watching her. I mean I'm I'm probably not giving you any sort of explanation there. I mean it it is whatever it is. I yeah. suppose with, with the with the with the working of the piece, it's probably going back to what we were talking about about you know how how do you kind of combine worlds and you know the outrageous and the funny and the kind of edgy and the tender. You just have to be as kind of honest as uh, as you possibly can be, and kind of keep asking yourself, "Am I doing the right thing here? Is this the right? Is am I am I being as honest as I possibly can? Am I doing my mother justice? Um, because she is the subject matter. So obviously, there's there's themes of respect, but there's also pairing away of um, Pairing away of preconceived ideas of of what's right and what's wrong, and and there's something about dementia itself that you know filters break down, and you know uh, uh, we stop. In my mother's case, and uh, she stopped worrying about things, stopped becoming concerned about things, and I thought that I needed to do a little bit of that as well if I wanted to get this uh, a message across, or if I wanted to make people feel something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. But I mean, you, the the performers that you've chosen to work with, are, they are extraordinary. And Lucia has this particular kind of earthy physicality, which is which is just compelling to watch. Absolutely. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Be really beautiful. And um, Magali, of course, as well. Um, Magali is the most incredible performer ever. And um, I was so lucky to get both of them at the same time. But, uh, you know, Magali, who for me encompasses um, everything I love in a dancer. Uh, she started off in the, you know, uh, like doing cabaret and, you know, and Folie, I don't know if it was Folie Berger, but, you know, she definitely in Paris, you know, started her career like uh, doing kind of TV dancing. And, and you can kind of see that in her. You can see this side, which is a show woman, you know, mm-hmm. but then kind of went on to have an incredible career as, uh, you know, and and still as a as a contemporary dancer with the best choreographers in Paris, in France and um, and she's like so she's got this wonderful thing that she can pull this 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 burlesque or this show side out and bring it into this world which is which is just my favorite thing and Lucia is just uh when I look at Lucia I just see her the, the talent and the life that she exudes and as you said this groundedness and she's at her best moment as a choreographer and and, and well no she's got so much more to do and so much better but but when I see her I think um wow you're brilliant and I, I just love that you know I, I love to be able to kind of really be in, in love as, with the dancers that I'm working with you know that really it's, it's such a great thing yeah. And also, you know, you can relax a bit because everyone's watching them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm having a coffee side stage. <laughs> um, I wanted to, um, um, before we kind of tie up, I guess, I, I really wanted to ask you a question about um, audio in the piece. Um, and particularly because, um, so there is, the, the, you work with this filmmaker, Luca Truffarelli, and... Um, uh, so they're either kind of narrow strips at the top or they're little sections. But one of the things that haunts me about the, um, his filmmaking is the, the way that he uses the audio. And again, for people who haven't seen the piece, um, your mother's singing 
um, is a big part of that audio. And she has quite the, quite an extraordinary uh, voice. Mm -hmm. um, and so that there are these fragments of songs. Um, but you also have um, another section more near the beginning, which is the Popeye section, um, which were my poor little first years listening to that. So um, but again, for those who haven't uh, seen it, um, Philip tells a story about uh, about getting this Popeye doll for his birthday. And then this whole section is, it's really about, uh, well, do you want to tell the story rather than me? Yeah, it's probably. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yes, so basically, uh, I'll tell the story first and then I'll explain. Yeah. When I was a kid, uh, I was probably, you know, uh, hitting puberty and, you know, discovering my body masturbation was something that you know I just like wow what is this and I was having a great time and <laughs> my, <laughs> my mother was bringing me down Henry Street and we saw uh, a, 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 a life size I say life size it was the same size as me a Popeye and um, and Popeye and I said I, I would love Popeye for my birthday and Popeye and I ended up having a, a kind of a three-year relationship <laughs> and, and the reason, uh, so so basically, I uh, in, in the piece, uh, Lucia comes out on stage dressed as Popeye, and we kind of do a, a, a piece of choreography together. Uh, but the soundtrack is porn, and like uh, gay porn particularly. And I, uh, yeah, I watched it this morning, and I was shocked myself. I was thinking, oh my god, like, like <laughs> what is? How, how the hell did I do that? And also, the whole time I was working on it. I think my neighbors must have thought like, you know, playing it full blast, you know, what, whatever and whenever, but I was working on it quite a lot. And I think anytime they passed, they must have thought, oh my God, there he is in there again, listening to his porn or watching his porn. But, um, but the reason I did that was because also, I think as a carer, uh, it was to highlight the point that often as a carer, um, you kind of lose a sense of identity. And uh, so you're so wrapped up in what this person is and what this person needs. And and it's often, you know, it can be quite lovely, but like it can be, it doesn't always have to be unpleasant is what I mean, but it can also, there's also a lot of things which are just not very rock and roll. And so with the sense of loss of identity and rock and roll, you, uh, sexuality is something that comes into it. I mean, you're like, how can you be this and be that was my question, basically, you know. Can you pat your dog and watch porn? Can you, like, uh, what, can, can two sensations happen at the same time? That was kind of my question. And so somehow thinking about all of this made me, alongside the very important and tender uh, showing the very important and tender relationship with my mother, I wanted to go a little bit edgy and deal with sexuality as well at the same time, so that people had to see those two things together and, and feel a bit weird. And I think that that's important. Mm -hmm. Then they can then they can have come up with their own conclusions. But that's where it actually came from. And it was actually a real story. No porn was involved at the time. It was just me and Popeye. <laughs> <laughs> it's what, what I found interesting again because I uh, I remember this um, when I was in uh, the Everyman and my main feeling was um, my feeling of, of of the students and and uh, that, that be, and it's not just that it was the audio porn because it takes a little while for you to kind of work out what it is and then you're like oh that's what it is because it's audio which is really interesting and um but what's um another thing that's uh, so unsettling about that section as well as hilarious is that um, it just goes on and on and on. <laughs> it's really uncompromising. <laughs> um, and uh, in, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not, it, it's in some ways unconnected, but in, in its status as audio, the whole way that Luca edits the audio of your mother in relation to the film, I, I think is really haunting and an important part of the, fi the film because they're often, sometimes the audio is what is in the film, um, and but very often it isn't. And there's that that counterpoint. And um, there's something also I think about as somebody who works in audio as well, that there's something powerfully embodied about audio. Yeah, that um, that sometimes the visual image doesn't quite capture. And um, I, I wondered if that was part of um, Luca and yours thinking in terms of using audio in that way in the piece. 
Yes. Well, so Luca did all of the sound design in that piece and in, in the subsequent piece, Manifesto Memorializing. And he has a great, an amazing sensitivity to how to hold the space and create the space. And Luca and I have worked together for since I've been making since I've been making work. We've we've worked together, and he's like a, an, a, for me such a necessary extension to to what I do because he's so he's so fantastic and and talented. But um, he, he had been with my mother from the beginning of this. No, he knew her for a long time, but he had probably since 2014. He's known her, but he has had. We had been filming my mom, so Luca had been coming to my mom's house and uh, for at least a year uh, prior to making the piece, and Luca was recording and then taking it back and examining stuff. So it wasn't that we ever set set out to have a particular sound or a particular image. I have to, you know, that was me talking to Luca and saying, look, I feel that this section needs this, and then he'd go away and work and come back with something. So. Uh, and yeah, my mum, the, the voice that she, uh, that was a very particular time, that voice. So she didn't always sound like that. And it's quite interesting listening to it today. So as somebody is, you know, uh, somebody who's living with dementia is going through different stages. There was one stage when she was really into communicating through voice. And of course, I would sing with her a lot and dance with her because I felt that that opened up certain neural pathways and it brought her into the present in a very nice way and but connecting her to things you know often it was much easier to uh to to remember the words of a song than remember you know somebody's name or or, or or something like that so singing became quite an active part and by the way I'm using last tense now a uh, past tense now because my mum is is okay but she's she's quite advanced in her dementia so she speaks very seldomly now but just just so that that's clear and um but she uh but it, it was just very interesting that whole thing you know the way she the yeah. way uh, that that particular sound is very specific to a very particular time which is when we made assisted solo okay i lost you for a little while there but um but yeah um that sense that um it's a different they're like layers of an onion the different layers of, of dementia it, Exactly, exactly. And that, that that was just specific. That 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 kind of high pitched um you know vibrato that she, oh. had, she would kind of answer everything in that, you know, how are you? I'm fine. You know, it was a really it was a really kind of unusual thing, which made me think, was she singing because it opened a pathway? Was it easier to say I'm fine if she was singing? as opposed to just trying to speak it because it's a different part of the brain or something like that. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Whatever works, you do it, you know? Yeah. Okay, um, Philip, um, it's been such a pleasure to to speak with you. Um, I want to, is there anything that we didn't go over that you wanted to speak about in terms of this work? Um, I suppose just the the interesting thing, as, as I said, is that this work has led on to another work and you realize that, uh, you know, it led on to a very different piece, Mama Festa Memorializing, which was uh, three, me and two male dancers. Uh, and it, it was kind of a darker, angrier piece, but still allowed for emotion when I uh, still allowed for humor, I should say. And uh, when I was watching the piece uh, this morning, actually, um, what I noticed, assisted solo, I mean, uh, what I noticed about the humor for me is that they're the moments, those funny moments, they're the moments when I really cry, when I watch it, because there's a, such a fine line between humor and the deeply tragic. And comedy and tragedy, I mean, that's what theatre is, right? Mm -hmm. But there's such a fine line between that. So uh, I think that's why I'm interested in humour. And humour is a way of helping people understand mm -hmm. uh, what I want to say. Because it's in the humour that you really find the, you can, that I can really pinpoint the, the heartache and, and everything else. 
That's so interesting, Philip, because I it, it, because my emotional journey through the piece is probably opposite. But then it's it's not my piece, and um, it's so interesting that in 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 the places where it's about you coping with really really challenging situations, um, that 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 those are the parts that where where it where it gets you emotionally. Yeah, I think that um, I always reference. I read it years ago, and I I'm I'm not. I, I'm totally, I adore animals and, um, and I'm not into bullfighting at all. But uh, Ernest Hemingway wrote Death in the Afternoon, which was, uh, you know, in, in the period that he lived in, in, in Franco, Spain, I think, you know, he was traveling around and he kind of does an analysis of bullfighting. And he talks about the picadores, you know, um, the guys that come in and the horse at the beginning of the bullfight and the horses are all kind of dressed up and they kind of stab the bull. Yeah. And uh, there's something about that relationship which has really uh, resonated with me. But the horses uh, quite often in those bullfights would become injured and their entrails would be out. And there was he, Hemingway describes it as, as being there was something quite. Um, it was a parody in itself, this, mm. this horse staggering and kind of dying. There was something kind of um, existentially um, comical about about that and and I think that that for me encapsulates what humor is you know that it's it's kind of even though it's really funny and I mean it comes from a funny place but but there's there's something that okay. laughs at the the futility of existence or that laughs in the face of of yeah. of yeah. everything we don't understand because we don't understand it yeah We're just, laughing helps us cope I yeah. suppose thank you well, um, Philip, it's it's a real loss that people are not going to get to see um, assisted solo at this point. But um, I hope, obviously, we all hope that um, the Dublin Dance Festival and other um, opportunities to see your beautiful work. So um, thank you very much for um, being part of this interview. And I think we're going to be part of a Q&A when this is shown in a few weeks time. So. <laughs> it was lovely speaking with you, Jules. Yeah, you too. Take care. All right. Thank you. OK, bye.